You know, just before I came up here, I was thinking about this evening service and what I was going to be talking about, and I literally almost said good evening. So I'm glad I got the morning part correct as all the kids are exiting for, uh, I think they're going out for the Bible, Bible Bowl practice, right? And studying those scriptures downstairs and getting ready for that competition that's coming up. If you look on the screen behind me, we're going to continue on what I talked about last week. And last week we were talking about baby Jesus, but we were talking about, it, as I said, there's two times a year that we're able to speak with people, Christmas and Easter, right? Those are times of year that people are more open to at least to having conversations when it comes to God and when it comes to faith type things. And it's surely not everybody, but if you're, I'm trying to give you some uh, spiritual ammunition. So if you're there uh, amongst your families, conversations come up, maybe you could plant a seed. Maybe you could share some of this evidence like we were giving here this morning in our class uh, for Daniel chapter 5. We were, I gave, you know, Daniel chapter 5 is really a very simple chapter, but I tried to give quite a bit of evidence for historical record confirming the biblical record. Uh, even when the historical record thought the Bible got it wrong, you found out through uh, modern time archaeological digs that the Bible had it right all along. Daniel had it right all along. So I'm trying to give you some spiritual ammunition that you're able to use. Use it uh, to help people have a deeper, a stronger faith and help people who are on the fence or not sure what they believe to, to know that they could have faith, they could have confidence in the Word of God. And so this morning we're going to look at the indescribable gift. You know, there's different times of years that we uh, tend to give gifts, isn't there? I mean, you think about what, birthdays? Anybody ever get a birthday present? Of course you've got uh, birthday presents. It's customary to usually around certain holidays, uh, different times of the year, to give gifts to your loved ones, is it not? And it's something that it's practiced in many families and many cultures. It's nothing new to here to America. But gift giving, you think about birthdays, you think about weddings, you think about the birth of a new child, right? And uh, you think about uh, anniversaries. Uh, you think about, uh, well, the holiday season, the Christmas season, right? And so it's customary to exchange gifts a lot of times with your loved ones. And as we think about the gift giving, brethren, it's such a happy time, isn't it? I mean, especially when you have the little nuggets. It's a little different as the nuggets get older, you know what I mean? But when they were little, there's all the joy and the excitement to wake up on Christmas morning and to open up those presents and then the satisfaction on, on the face of, of, those, of, your, of their loved ones to see the excitement of them opening those gifts. And so, brethren, I want us to kind of consider something this morning. God has given us the most indescribable gift, the most unspeakable gift that mankind has ever received. And God is the giver of gifts. Look on the screen behind me, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. Thanks be to God for what? His indescribable gift. Some of our translations will say unspeakable gift. But indescribable, unspeakable, what is the context? What is it, what is it saying? Well, it's, it, it conveys the idea that words are not adequate to express all that there is or all that could be said about the significance of something. And so that is the situation that we Christians find ourselves in. That you think about uh, in 2 Corinthians 9 and 15. That we don't have the words to adequately describe the joy that we should have knowing the gift that God has given to us, his creation. And so brothers and sisters, you think of John 3, 16, right? It's not going to be on the screen behind me, but it teaches us that God, Jesus, is God's gift to humanity. Now, it doesn't use the word gift, but it says, for God so loved the world. Well, he so loved the world that he gave the gift of his son. It says he so loved the world that he gave us his son, so that all who believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so I want us to really consider the gift that Jesus is. And I want us to consider how often are we giving that gift to others. Brethren, the gifts that we receive, sure, they bring joy, but isn't that joy fleeting? Who here has been saving up for a new sound system? You know, that's back in the day before digital music. I remember when I got my first Kenwood stereo system, I was working at, I was working part-time in high school at, uh, oh, what was it, uh, ABC Appliance, right? And, I'm, and, and I got a discount on my first Kenwood stereo system, and I was all excited about it. And I'm like, man, this is going to be awesome. And it sounded good, don't get me wrong, right? I had, remember the big, you know, tower speakers and everything? It sounded good, but after a couple days, well, it's just like, well... It just became a radio, right? And even though it was nice and it was exciting and, you know, and I thought, man, I, I just needed it. I wanted it so bad. After a while, I was like, eh. 
you know. And then you start thinking about the next thing and the next thing. And so, sure, gifts can bring joy, but how often is that joy fleeting, right? How often is that joy fleeting? Remember what the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 when he said, when he said, rejoice in the Lord always. Always, I say, rejoice. Well, he had Jesus in mind. When he wrote that, he had Jesus in mind because Jesus is the gift that is given for all, for all time with whom and by whom we rejoice forever. And so you think about the season of giving, right? The season of giving is going to come to an end, but yet do not God's blessings continue on? Doesn't God's gifts and his blessings continue on in our daily lives? I mean, no matter how bad things are going, can't you look at your life and say, even though it's a struggle right now, Praise be to God, for I know that I'm still blessed. Yes. You see, there's always going to be struggles. There's always going to be times of calamity in your life. But even if you could look past the darkness, you could see the light. If you look past the darkness, you could see the blessings. And so, brethren, that's why we always have to keep in mind what Jesus has done for us. That's why it says on the front of our table up here, do this in remembrance of me. You know, we come together to worship and we sing songs and we say prayers and we have a sermon and, and we partake of the Lord's Supper. We, we take up a collection. But that's the most important part of the worship service. Amen. It's not the preacher. It's not the message. Sure, I'm preaching from the Word of God and we could, uh, we could take something from it. But that's the most important part of the, uh, of the service. And we should make sure that we should never rush through it. Tom did a wonderful job uh, on the table this morning, so thank you. But that is the center of the worship. And so, brethren, it's the center of the worship because it is the indescribable, unspeakable gift that God has given to mankind. Yeah. And so, brothers and sisters, we continue to look at this this morning. At any given moment, the Christian, Christian should reflect on the gift of Christ Jesus and the joy that it brings us. I want you to see that this isn't a one-off thing in one passage, right? You know, God was trying to create a theme here. And as I think about that theme here this morning over that indescribable gift, the Apostle Paul, he also said this in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is what? Eternal life in Christ Jesus. It's the free gift of God. Well, we know that sometimes gifts do have stipulations, and that's a whole other uh, story and another study for another day. But I want you to consider this next passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For what did the Scriptures tell us? For by grace you have been what? You have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is what? It is the gift of God. So you see, brethren, the Hebrew letter then also calls it the heavenly gift. Do you think there's a theme here? Right? Is God trying to let us in on a little secret here? That he is almighty God and he is the supreme gift giver. His, his gift is never going to, like that Kenwood speaker system, right? That Kenwood sound system where it sounded good and I was all excited to get it. But then after a few days, you're like, eh. You know, if I ever get to the point in my faith where Jesus is, eh, then I got a problem. Amen. Because he is the gift that keeps on giving. Amen. He is the gift that is for all mankind, for all seasons, for all times. And we need to make sure that we understand Jesus in the proper context of who he is. And that's Almighty God. And so, brethren, in the giving of the gift of salvation, God had gave his son as the perfect sacrifice for all mankind. And that's what it says in John 3 and 16. For he loved us so much. Don't forget that word so before it. He loved us so much that he gave his son. You see, brethren, I'd like us to consider the birth of Jesus for a second because... It's almost, un, it's almost, well, insulting how much we trivialize the birth of Jesus by relegating it to one day a year. Amen. During a holiday season that is so commercialized that, well, even the best of Christians don't very often even consider Christ. And I know that we, we know what the Bible teaches, and we, we, we celebrate Christmas as a cultural holiday and not a religious holiday. But at the end of the day... It gives us an opportunity, though, to talk about Jesus. But I just want to let us know that when we look at the birth of Christ, it almost, by relegating it to one day in December, it trivializes it. Statements like, Jesus is the reason for the season. Have you ever seen that? I've seen it on people's roofs and lights and different things. It's almost insulting. It's almost insultingly understated. Because Jesus is the reason for every season. Amen. Jesus is the reason for everything. How do I know that? Because look at this next passage of Scripture. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. What does it say? For by him, it's talking about Jesus. For by him, Jesus, all things were created, both in heavens and in the earth, visible and, is, and, and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things have been created for him and by him. For Jesus, by Jesus. So brethren, Jesus is the reason for everything. He's the one that created us. Everybody goes back, and they oftentimes, when you first start studying the Bible, where do you usually start? Well, I'm going to read the Bible for the first time. Let's go back all the way to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created, right? And everybody looks at that, and they attribute it to the Father. Not understanding that it wasn't the Father. Father's the architect, but Jesus is the one who actually did the creating. We know that because there's several passages of Scripture that speak to it. Colossians chapter 1, John chapter 1, uh, Hebrews chapter 1 that we can look at. So brethren, I mention all of this to just tell you that the birth of Jesus, it matters because, well, it's the most significant event in human history. Yeah. So let's not just relegate it to one day a year around a commercialized holiday. Let's consider it every day of the year. It, the significance behind that gift that, that goes out to all mankind. I mean, think about it. What year is it right now? You could say it. 2023. 2023. Not 2024 yet. 2023. Well, what is that? Why do I even ask that question? Lewis, why do you think I asked that question? It's the baseline for all dates. We're 2023 A.D. Anno Domini in the year of the Lord. We're 2023 years from the birth of Jesus Christ. If the world's millions of years old, well, why are we only at 2023? Somebody, had a mis somebody did something wrong there. There's a miscalculation somewhere. We're 2,023 years from the most important event in human history when God put on flesh and walked amongst men, who walked amongst his creation, who suffered night and was buried for his creation, who rose on the third day so that way we could have eternal life. And so, brethren, the events which everything before it led and to which everything uh, after it points is in 2023 goes all the way back to the beginning when Jesus was born. And so, brothers and sisters, we must be diligent in giving that gift to others. How, does the, how do we give that gift to others? What does that look like? You know, that's something that we must consider. I think back and I look at the scriptures in Luke chapter 2, and it tells us, so 2,000 years ago, there's this group of shepherds, right? They're minding their own business. They're out there in the fields. They're hanging out with the sheep. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, an angel appears, right? They're startled. But he says, my brothers, don't be, be, be afraid. And obviously paraphrasing, brothers, don't be afraid. And he says to them what? He, he assured them that there was no need for them to be afraid, for he had come to bring a message of good tidings and that they would bring joy to all the people of the world. The angel said in Luke chapter 2, Therefore, there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And we know that his name was going to be called Emmanuel. And Emmanuel simply means God with us. And so we know that his name means God with us. The name Emmanuel, which he was called, means God with us. And so then the multitude of the heavenly host, right after this happens in Luke chapter 2, we see that the heavenly host, they begin to sing praises to God for this awesome event. And so in order for God to provide salvation for his creation, some very important things need to take place. And we're going to look at four of those things here this morning, uh, the four major things that need to take place so that mankind can have salvation. And the, fall, the four following events are necessary for God to be able to forgive his creation and to allow us to accept the gift that he freely gives. And that first great event is the foretelling of a redeemer. It goes all the way back. Even though God had promised to, to Eve all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 that her seed would bruise the he, uh, bruise the head of the her seed would bruise the head of the serpent in Genesis 3 and 15. Then we see in uh, uh, Gal or not Galatians, Genesis chapter 12 and 22 that God had promised Abraham that his descendant would what? His descendant would be a blessing to all mankind. And so, brethren, you look at these promises, and it was not clearly really understood who the seed was going to be until Isaiah made it fairly obvious. You guys remember Isaiah chapter 53, if you've been in the Bible at all? I want you to look at this uh, next passage of Scripture on the screen behind me. 
Because even though we know that a Savior, a Redeemer was coming, and that the seed of the woman was going to bruise the head of the serpent, we know that uh, Abraham was promised that one of his seeds would be a blessing to all mankind, then it may, becomes fairly obvious, starting in Isaiah 53. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment for our well-being, it fell upon him. And, his scourge, and by his scourging we are healed. Now this next passage is longer. If it's a little too small to see on your screen, flip over to Isaiah 53. Because we're going to look at verses 10, 11, and 12 now. And I want you to see what these verses have to say becomes fairly obvious. Because did, did verse 5 sound a little bit familiar? Then look at verses 10 through 12. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the greats, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he had poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Brethren, you look at Isaiah 53, and it became fairly obvious who it was talking about. And then you fast forward to, uh, I believe it's Acts chapter 8, and you see Philip goes down. God sends Philip down because there's an Ethiopian eunuch. He's on a journey. He was, he was in town. He's a proselyte, a Jewish proselyte. He's in town to worship God at the temple. And all of a sudden, he's on his way back home. It's a 1,500-mile journey. And this, this, this eunuch, he's on his way home. And all of a sudden, you have, he's reading something. He's reading the scrolls. And Philip runs up to him and he asks him a question. He says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I unless somebody explains it to me? And he says, I'm reading Isaiah 53. And from Isaiah 53, the next line says, he preached Jesus to him. Amen. So you see, brother, and you look at that, you look at Isaiah 53. Isaiah made it fairly obvious uh, who was the Redeemer was going to be. And then you look at passages like Acts chapter 8, and you read the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and you look at all of the Messianic prophecies, and you start to put the pieces of the puzzle together, it becomes fairly obvious who they are talking about. And so, brethren, Isaiah clearly was, he was clearly saying that this suffering servant would be man's deliverer. This suffering servant would be the Redeemer who was to come. And now the second great event is the miraculous conception and the birth of the Redeemer. I'm not going to go too much into this because we spoke on it last week. But I want you to understand that this Redeemer was to suffer for our sins. If he was to suffer for our sins, then God would need to take on the form of a man. Because only God, being deity, can offer a one-time sacrifice for all times, for eternity. Why? Because he is an eternal being. And so he offered a one-time eternal sacrifice for all mankind. So you see, brothers and sisters, an angel came to Mary, a virgin, and let her know that she would conceive a child by the Holy Spirit and that he would be called Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And his name will be called Emmanuel, thus meaning that God is with us. And so from that very moment when his birth finally comes to fruition, we know that from the feeding trough, from the manger, that hope had gone out to the world from a little town of Bethlehem. So you see, brothers and sisters, that's the second great event. There's a third great event that is going to take place, and that is the perfect sinful life that Jesus had to live in order to be the Savior of the world, in order to be that indescribable, unspeakable gift that the Bible references. And so, brethren, I want you to consider for a second that when Jesus took on flesh, and at the age of 30 years old, he started his public ministry. He experienced all that we experienced, did he not? Did he not experience the highs and lows of life? Was he not hungry and thirsty at times? Was, did he not become tired? Did he not bleed? Was he not ridiculed? Was he not slandered? What is there that, that we experienced that he himself did not experience? So you see, brethren, yes, the birth of Jesus Christ matters. It matters because one of the three personalities of the Godhead put on flesh and dwelt among his creation. Amen. So yes, does the birth of Jesus matter? Absolutely. 
But brethren, we need to understand that we need not to trivialize it. One day or one week out of the year, we need to make sure that's something that's constantly on our mind and that we as the disciples of Jesus Christ are letting the world know that, that this is something that needs to be celebrated and remembered throughout our various lives. That third great event, as I talked about, that perfect sinful life that he had to live in order to be the sacrifice for our sins, Jesus did not sin. We know that. And I want you to see in this next passage of Scripture what John the baptizer had to say. John the baptizer sees Jesus coming towards him. And he says, look, he says, the next day when he saw him coming, behold, the Lamb of God who what? Takes away the sins of the world. Did you remember anything from Isaiah chapter 53? Is there any correlation there? Absolutely, the correlation is there. And we see, when you start putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, that nothing in all of history can compare with the Son of God dying for the sins of mankind. Yeah. Nothing reaches the heart of a sinner or warms the heart of God's people more than telling about the love of God and the love that He has for His creation. And then the fourth and final thing before I close it down, brethren, is going to talk about the resurrection. Because death could not hold Jesus. And now Jesus, as we learn in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, it says that he has the keys to death and to Hades. Well, why is that important? Well, it's important because all who have died and have gone on before us have gone into the Hadean realm and could not get loose. But Jesus has the keys and will open the gates so that all mankind can be resurrected. Brethren, this is our assurance. It's our assurance that God's promise of a resurrection can be trusted. It can be believed because Jesus has already had victory over death. Jesus has already been resurrected from the dead. He appeared to over 500 individuals uh, in the 40 days post-resurrection. He had meals with his, with his apostles. He allowed Thomas, doubting Thomas, to, to see the holes in his hands, to put his hand in his side, and for Thomas to say, My Lord and my God. For he understood who was standing before him. So you see, brothers and sisters, we need to really fully understand and realize that, yes, Jesus is the greatest gift for all mankind, but there's a catch. While we're all going to be raised, not all of us are going to be raised to the same destiny. I know that because of what the scriptures teach. John 5, 28, 29 is one example. But you see, brothers and sisters, all four of these great events were absolutely necessary for God to provide a just means for his forgiving us and allowing us to get back into relationship with the holy and righteous God. All of these steps had to take place. Is one step more important than another? Not really. But we go back and it all begins, though, with the birth of Jesus Christ. It all goes back with the Son of God, deity, God himself putting on flesh, dwelling amongst his creation, living a perfect life, and then resurrecting at the appropriate time when all was accomplished. Brethren, we need to make sure that no matter how or what we get involved in in this life, we need to remain grateful. And we ought to be for, we need to be remain, remain grateful for God's unspeakable gift of his love and his mercy. And we need to understand and make sure that we or fully appreciate that indescribable, unspeakable gift, the gift of Jesus, the gift of salvation that we all have an opportunity to receive. What better gift could you give a family member, a friend or a coworker this holiday season than to introduce them to Jesus, the God-man? What greater gift could you give them than the truth of God's word that is going to hopefully prick their hearts and then lead them on a journey of self-reflection, repentance, and change? You see, brethren, we need to make sure that, that if we're willing and able and somebody uh, is, is willing to have that, that, the ear to hear, we need to make sure that we're sharing this message with them. Because as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we have to go out into the world. We have to spread the seed by proclaiming the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when, as humble and faithful servants, we do it in love. We do it in love. We don't have any high-pressure tactics. We simply give them the truth in love, and we allow that truth to penetrate their hearts. And if they have the good soil, then we know, brethren, that, 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 that seed will produce a 30, 60, 90 fold. You see, brothers and sisters, but it's going to take us being willing to spread the seed, to do what God asked us to do in the first place, and that's to go. 
Go out into all the world, making disciples of all creation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that we go out in the authority of God to do these things in His authority because He's the Word, He's God, He's Jesus, the Savior. So brethren, if you're hearing this message today, but you're not a child of God, you're not a child of God, you can change that. If you want to be baptized, you've been studying the scriptures, you've been studying with somebody, you've been reading for yourself, you know that Jesus is the, uh, the Son of God, you want to make that, uh, that proclamation known here today that you believe that, you could go down into the baptistry. You could have your sins washed away. You could receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If that is your desire here this day, come forward as we stand and sing. Song of Invitation.